the cord. Okay, now we are officially beginning. So welcome again. Here is our Nature's Notebook website. So you can always get there using this URL, usanpn.org slash nature's underscore notebook. Or um, let me put it in the chat box for you as well. Hang on one second. The easier way to do it is just to go to www.naturesnotebook. So there's the link. Um, you should feel free to bookmark that if you want to be able to find it again. And then I think a lot of you have already created observational accounts in Nature's Notebook. But if you haven't, then um, what you need to do is just come down here and click on Join Nature's Notebook. And it should take you to the page where we ask you to set up your account. So this is just like any thing that you would create online. We don't really ask a lot of information. You can fill in some details about your bio if you want. But um, basically, it's just going to ask you to set up a username and a password with your email. And that is good enough for using Nature's Notebook for now. Um, we also have a way that you can receive um, monthly or bi-monthly newsletters that my colleague Erin sends out. So in the process of signing up, if you click the box that says, um, you know, I want to get that newsletter, then you'll, you'll automatically get it. And you can unsubscribe at any time. And then the other thing that I will say is when you are creating your account, you want to make sure that you're joining the Ohio Phenology Gardens group that we already have in here. So you'll scroll down on the list of groups. And let me see if I can locate it. We have a lot now, so that's a long list. There we go. It's under cooperative extension. So once you get down the list, if you expand cooperative extension, <coughs> Ohio State University Phenology Gardens is nested underneath that. And then you can expand that again. And while we're here, I will show you all of the sites that we've already got established for the Ohio Phenology Gardens. I had made some notes the other day about the gardens that you all are in, and I think there are a few that we do need to add. So they're not, they're not in here yet, just because we hadn't set them up. But um, for the ones that are already existing, those are the ones that we've got. So um, feel free to join any or all of those. And then if yours is not listed there yet, then we will after this call, the next step is to get all of the ones that we need to be set up in there. So I probably will round you all up again on email and um, make sure that you have what you need to request a group in our database. So um, that will be an email that I send out after the call and it'll give you the specific steps on how to do that. So once you do all of that and you join the group that you want to, um, you just go down to the bottom of the page and save. And then once you save your account, it should bring you to your observation deck, which is the place where if you're using your computer, all of the information that you need to observe with Nature's Notebook is found. So let's give my computer and internet a minute to catch up with my brain. Dun, dun, dun. There we go. So it'll take you to your observation deck. And then the other thing you'll notice on your observation deck is we are in the process of creating an observer certification course, which I would highly recommend doing if you are going to start observing with Nature's Notebook. Um, we will probably have about five or six modules in here by the end of the summer, but right now we've just got our how to observe module uploaded and ready to go. So once you take that course, then you will have this little checkbox next to your your list here that says that you're certified. Um, and that also shows up in our database. So data end users will be able to see people that have gone through the online observer course. And then they'll know, you know that these folks have a little more experience with Nature's Notebook and they, they are you know, at least working on understanding the protocols and doing it with a certain level of accuracy. So that's all there. And then at the bottom is where your observation deck will be with the list of 
sites. So mine is really long because I work with tons of people everywhere. But when you first join, you'll just have something that says my sites, like you can see on the bottom here, and then probably whichever Ohio Phenology Garden group that you are able to join will show up in the list here. So you can toggle between those two things. Does somebody have a question? Feel free to interrupt me if you do have questions. I have a question. Yeah. Um, if we do this as an individual, mm -hmm. um, should, when we're doing this for a garden, should we have a separate um, kind of um, login and everything just for our garden, our extension garden? Or can we use our own personal one and also have the extension garden listed? Then anybody who has a personal one could also add the extension garden to their observation sites. Exactly. The second thing that you said. Okay. So that's what our group functionality allows us to do. So you can create a group that other people can also join. So anybody can do it under their personal account. And then, you know, when you're not observing there anymore, you can also leave the group. Um, but that way, everybody that's participating with observing at that garden is observing the same plants, which is okay. really also what's very important. We don't want a bunch of people to set up personal sites where they're tracking the same plants because they're not going to essentially be in the database exactly the same. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's one of the reasons why we have it set up that way. And the other reason is um, we found that people that were at organizations were creating like an email account that everyone was sharing and a login that everyone was sharing. And that's really not a great way to be managing data from any perspective, let alone from a nature's notebook perspective. But that way it just sort of lets you have that personal connection to the group. And then you can also have your separate personal sites. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good question. Anybody else have a question yet? Okay. Well, just feel free to, to shout if you do as I'm going along. So the other thing that we have then is these sites that are groups. You'll have your Ohio Phenology Gardens here at the top level. And then the ones that you have joined or the ones that belong to that will show up here. And um, each site, these are the sites that are within the group you can arrange the plants that you are observing. Like I said, you'll be observing the same individuals through time and everybody that's participating in the group will be contributing data on those same plants. So um, the way that it's set up here, for example, with this Cruge Garden that we have in our campus arboretum, um, anybody that joins the group can see that. And what you can't do is if you're not an admin, you can't edit any of this stuff. So all of these links here are available for me to do stuff to because I'm an admin on that site. But if you are not an admin, let me find one where I'm not. Let's see. Yeah, if you're not an admin, this is what you would see. So you can see the only thing that I can do is print out the data sheets so that I can go out in the field and observe. Does that make sense? Yes. Cool. Okay. So what we need from you all, and you don't have to do this for all of eternity, but just until we get things set up, I would like to have each of you be sort of the admin to get the group set up for Denise so that she can have that available to her. And that would mean that you will be able to edit and add the plants and put them in the order that they appear outside, however you want to do that. So um, this Cruge Garden site that we have, these plants are arranged in order as people can walk around the garden. So you can imagine them following a trail and then seeing those plants along the way. Um, so they're just sort of arranged in nature's notebook in the way that you would find them on the ground to make it a little easier. And we also happen to have signs that we put outside. You don't need to do this if you don't have funding for it. Maybe you can just use little tags, but that that's the way that people will be able to relocate the plants that you're asking them to observe each time so they know which one's which. And then they can match the name of the plant here to the name that's on the tag. Um, <clears throat> it's pretty easy to do this part in Nature's Notebook. So um, once you're ready to add a new plant, you'll just click on this Add or Edit Plants button and then you can see. <clears throat> okay, what, can I interject a question? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Um, we painted uh, river rocks with numbers, one through 54. Uh -huh. and, and they go in order uh, where they are along the path. 
yep. is can we enter the plant number and plant name? Yep, you can definitely do that. So um, when you go to add your plant, like you can see for this barrel cactus that I have here, the nickname is editable. So you can call that whatever you want. You can call it one dash barrel cactus okay. or um, whatever you have the thing that matches the label on the plant out there on the rock. That sounds like a great way to do that. I love that idea. Thank you. Yep. And you can always go back and edit and change these things as long as you're an admin. Um, you can fill out as much information here when you're setting up the plants as you like. So you can tell us if it's wild or if it's on a drip or if it's fertilized. Um, any of that information is not required. The only thing that is required are these first two things with the asterisks next to it. So um, obviously you've got to put the plant in there so people can find it, but the rest of the information is just kind of, you know, up to you if you want to track that. It's useful because some people that use the data will, um, maybe they'll be looking for data in a particular region where they want to find things in a demonstration garden versus things that are occurring in native habitat and then they'd be able to compare it. So if you had filled that out, that would tell them a little bit more about your space. So um, entirely up to you, but recommend it. If you, if you know that information and it's easy to fill in, then go ahead and fill that in. And then the same thing will happen um, if you have a plant that, as we know, dies or gets removed because the, the landscape crew comes through and does something over the weekend that you weren't hoping they would do. Um, we have a way to delete the plants from the list that people are observing. And you could tell us if it's um, dead or why you want to remove it. And then that way, um, the data will still remain in the database, but the plant won't show up on the list anymore for people to observe. So um, that's just something to keep in mind. And all of these things that I've told you so far, um, I will send you links to our how to observe materials. We have online tutorials that kind of show you step by step how to go through and add stuff, um, how to delete things, um, and all that stuff is all, it's all available online. So just don't feel like you have to quickly memorize what I'm telling you. <laughs> so. The other thing that you can do is we have the ability to capture one image for a plant. Um, so it's not really designed to have different phenophases pictured or um, it's not really usable for helping people to identify the species. But what it more is related to is giving people a sense of that full form photo of the plant in the garden so that if they are unable to see the tag or they're not quite sure if they're looking at the right thing, having that picture available is useful for them to be able to see, oh, okay, it's this barrel cactus that's over there by the soap tree yucca or whatever. So that's just an option to have there. Okay. So once you add the plants that you are interested in, if you hadn't added them in the order that they appear on the ground, um, you can sort them and put them in the right order by clicking on this link for sort plants. And basically it just gives you a list of everything that is being observed at that site. And then you can move things up or down in relation to the order you want them to appear. So do you just click and drag? Yep, you just highlight this and then you actually, I don't know if you can drag. You just click and then click on the up or down button and okay. it will like, move it down that way. Okay. And then let's see. The animals is a separate thing. I know several of you are interested in adding some of the pollinators to that. So um, it's kind of the same idea where you sort through the list and then you just click to add it to your checklist and then it'll show up in the main list of everything that people are observing. And then, of course, you can remove it if you're not going to be observing that thing. Um, so, so there you have it. Okay. Let's see. And then the next thing on the list here is where the field data sheets are. So if people are going to be using paper data sheets, then um, you can create a printout for them if you want to have that available and you just print it and then people can pick up the data sheets or once they log in, they can go to the same place because that is something that will be active. If you're not an admin, anybody can print out the data sheets for that site. And we have two ways that you can print them out. And one of them is a day by day um, 
sheet. So this includes every species that you have on the list in the order that it is in the observation deck so that people can just take that out for one day and then go through all the species and observe what they need to observe versus the other format is species by species. So this will have all of um, the red maple for that red maple number one, there's multiple days that you can add on there. So whichever way people feel more comfortable printing that out, um, it's totally up to you, however, however you feel like doing that. And then of course we do also have the mobile app that um, a lot of people are starting to use more regularly than the paper data sheets because that eliminates that extra step of having people taking the data on paper and then having to come to the nature's notebook observation deck and enter the data online. If you're using the mobile app, it automatically will upload it to the database. So you don't have to do anything else to it other than enter the data on your phone. And we are actually so close, like this close, to being able to release the new version of the mobile app that we've been working on for the last year and a half. So I think that should be available in mid-June for everybody to use. Um, but all you need to do right now is just go either if you have an Android phone or an iPhone or tablet, just go to their um, either the iTunes store or the Google Play store to download the app there. And it'll add it to your phone. It's, if you do a search for nature's notebook without an apostrophe S, it should come up on both of those platforms. But I will include the link um, and a mobile app tip sheet that we have that you can use for the app that we have right now. Um, and we'll, we'll be making another one for the new app as soon as that's available and ready. Okay. Do you have any questions about that stuff? All right. Um, you can also print out the data sheets in this column um, for each plant and animal that you've got on the list. And what that does is it takes you to our plant that's the protocol species profile page. And this is where we have written out the exact thing that you're to be observing when you're out there observing. Um, the one thing that we talked about, Denise and I talked about, is how, what you all should capture as far as the data is being concerned. So I think um, for the most part, you all are observing the bloom times for the plants that you have. And we'll wanna make sure that you're still doing at least those things so that the data are comparable through time. But then if you feel more comfortable as time goes on after you've been observing and you want to enter data on some of the other things that we have in the protocol, by all means, you're welcome to do that. You don't have to fill out something for each thing on the list. So just start with whatever you're comfortable with identifying and entering. And then, you know, you can always put a question mark next to it because we have the ability for people to say yes, no, or I don't know. Um, and then that way, you know, as you get more comfortable, maybe you'll be able to identify that a little bit easier. And um, the same thing with the intensity. We are making some tutorials to go in that learner observer certification course. So um, when those are ready, you might want to just take a look at how to measure intensity and how to do all of those things, just in case you are interested in capturing that. So and for every plant and animal that we have in the database, there's a suite of usually eight to 10 different things to answer. So um, again, depending on how your comfort level is with any of those things, or the, if there's other folks that are observing with you, the same thing goes for them. If they're not really comfortable identifying some of these other protocols, then they don't have to capture the data on them until they're ready. That makes sense. And I would recommend, if you haven't already done that, if you go to our observe menu on all of the Nature's Notebook page, pages, if you click on the plants and animals, that's gonna take you to the list where you can search through all the plants and animals and then just type in whatever you're, whatever you're after. <clears throat> I have a question on that. Yeah. Um, are the ones in the list um, are things only that you have people who are interested in getting the observations from? So if I were to type in something that I, I had and saw a lot and wanted to include and it didn't show up, it was because nobody wanted to look at it. Is that correct? Yeah, that's typically how we build our species list. Um, the one thing I might recommend if maybe you already did this is just use the scientific name to search 
um, in case the common name that you were using, maybe not the same one that shows up in the ITIS plants database, which is where we get that from. Um, so before, before you say not in there, take a look. Um, but yes, that's essentially how we've built the species list. And we take species requests every year, but what we really want to make sure is that we have somebody that will be looking at the data in some way so that we don't have a bunch of species that only one or two people are observing. Okay. Um, and we're trying to focus, focus that on, you know, people that actually have a group of folks to observe. Mm -hmm. So I would say in the Ohio Phenology Gardens case, um, I know Pat has given us a list of things that you all are already observing, and there's a couple of things that were not on the database yet. So we're going to add some of those species this year, um, and they'll show up next year. And typically, what we do is we take uh, like open requests for species through the summer, the last day to submit them for inclusion in the following year's release of species is August 30th. So um, you can always fill out a species request form and I can put that link in the information that I'll send to you. Um, and then that's where that'll go to our data manager and she'll create the protocol. And um, typically the spring species become available usually in February or March. Um, and then they're ready for that observational year. So good question. All right, anybody have any other questions about species or the protocol? The other thing that we've been working on that are um, tools for helping observers identify the different phenophases are um, phenophase photo guides. So there's a little bit of information about that here on the plant and animal page. And we've been slowly collecting observation resources for the species that we have on the list. It's definitely a slow process though, because we're here in Tucson and most of the plants are not occurring here. So we can't just sit down and make photo guides for everything. Um, essentially we're crowdsourcing these guides from the researchers that are asking for them through campaigns or um, local phenology leaders who are people that are running um, observation programs at different sites across the country. Um, especially I teach a class twice a year and those folks have as one of their deliverables, deliverables to design one of these phenophase photo guides so that we can take a look and see if it's available to put up here on the list. But we have a, a small list of things here that um, have photo guides that are already completed let me see if I can find a good one. Here's an apple. Let's just look at the apple. It'll download it into a PDF. <clears throat> and then give you a quick sense of it. These are really useful to have for people as they are learning what the protocol is because there's a space to talk about why people are observing the plant. There's a place to put a full form photo of that plant, kind of like what I was describing, which shows up in Nature's Notebook. And then um, on the second page, if my computer will cooperate, we've got pretty decent photos of each of the phases along with the protocol typed out here verbatim so that it's the same exact thing that we're asking people to look at. And that's kind of a critical piece because we want to make sure that people that are observing are all starting from the same place and they're all starting with the same information to standardize the protocol. And then that way when people are saying yes or no to those particular phases, we can with some confidence say that everybody is reading that the same way and doing the same thing. So um, like I said, we don't have these guides available for very many species yet, but we're, we're working on it. And there are increasingly large numbers of photos that are becoming available online that are in the Creative Commons place where you can use them for educational materials. So if we didn't get the photos from the researchers that are interested in the project, then um, we're trying to collect them ourselves. So if that is something that any of you all are interested in helping with as you're out there observing and you want to take some decent pictures of those phenophase protocol um, or phenophases in each of the protocol, then um, by all means, we would be happy to have your photos to put on the list. 
You can make your own photo guide too. So we have the templates for those that um, all you need to do is swap in and out the photo um, and include some information about the plant that is at your particular location. So that's, that's something to think about. Um, and we have a way to contribute the photo guides to us. So you can either email phenophases at usanpn.org or um, photos at usanpn.org. And we've got a, um, a Flickr page, which we're switching to SmugMug, but anyhow, we've got an online place where we've got photos that are available to use. Question? Yeah. Integrated pest management part of this at all? Um, it is in the sense that we have uh, several campaigns that are related to pests this year. And some of the species that we have available are related to pests. So yes, um, I'll really quickly flip over here and show you what I mean on the um, USA NPN page, which is always accessible here at the top. Um, we have models and maps that are used that include things like the growing degree, the growing degree day. Uh, maps so that people can get a sense of, you know, when it's time to treat certain things that they're interested in, making sure that are not showing up in the garden. <laughs> um, and then if you look at our campaigns, which can be accessed through the observe menu and join a campaign, then um, we have this year something that's called pest patrol, um, where essentially people can either sign up for an email that will send them an email when their growing degree day threshold has been met, which is really useful for a lot of the managers that are out there doing things to treat some of these invasive species. Or you can collect observations on the species that are, are on our list right now. So there's a whole list of those invasive plants and animals here. Are there any links to Ohio State fact sheets and have they opened them up that, to your knowledge? Um, that's a good question. I don't think we have linked on any of these pages um, the Ohio fact sheets, but I know that Doug was involved in this and helping us make this. So um, that is, because a lot of the data that they were working with were um, included in the project that we made. So we have some fact sheets here that we made in conjunction with each of those researchers that is interested in that. So that might be something that you're interested in exploring and sharing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, that's if you go to the observe menu and then join a campaign. That's the, the quickest way to get there. And then on each of the pages, you can sign up to get a, um, the message for each of those things. Okay, let's see what else. So the, the next thing that I wanna show you all is this link here for groups has a lot of information about how to set up and manage a group, both in person on the ground. So if you're gonna be the person that is managing a bunch of or a small number of volunteers that's helping collect the data, um, this is a good place to start. Or if you are just gonna be with us to help us establish the group in Nature's Notebook, um, and you'll be an admin and maybe we'll add somebody else to it and then everybody else can, is kind of on their own to, to do what it is they need to do. There's also some resources here for helping you get started. So what we call people that are managing programs um, for either education or um, science or land management, we call them local phenology leaders. And typically, um, a local phenology leader has created a local phenology program, which means they have a very specific goal in mind for why they're using nature's notebook on the ground. And the goal can again be either related to education. So maybe it's about just getting people interested in science or helping them to understand the natural um, habitat and understand the phenology of species. Or it could be a little more involved where there is an education person and a manager or a researcher person that is interested in better understanding a specific science question at each of the sites. And so they're working together um, with you know, the education group of folks, getting people to observe regularly and making sure they have the materials to understand how to use Nature's Notebook. And then the manager or the researcher using the data that those people are collecting. So regardless, there's a whole, um, 
a whole thing that we have on our website here that you can learn about these local phonology programs. I have a guide to creating a local phonology program. And I also, that's the class that I mentioned, I teach the course twice a year in the spring and the fall. It's a 10 week online course where it's basically work at your own pace, but what you do weekly is get together with the other members of your cohort and um, we have an online meeting and a call and we work through some things to help people get their programs established at their site. And that includes um, learning how to use nature's notebook. It includes thinking about what the goals are. It includes thinking about who your other stakeholders are. And if there are researchers or other people that are interested in the information you're collecting, um, how to get them involved. So it's, it's a pretty detailed course, but the thing that we've noticed is people that at least give this a think before they start using Nature's Notebook are the ones that have more success. So those Nature's Notebook programs stick around a lot longer because they've kind of thought about how this meets some other programmatic goal and um, you know, they really have a sense of how they're gonna share the data with the observers. And essentially what Denise was running prior is a local phonology program. They just didn't happen to be using Nature's Notebook yet, but I would consider that for sure a local phonology program because they had a science question in mind. They had groups of people that were collecting observational data at a variety of sites. Denise was at uh, one point communicating back with people with the data worth telling everybody. And so that was kind of a robust engagement process. Um, I think we'd like to get back to the place where that sort of thing is happening again. But what we really need is people at the gardens and the sites to be those folks that are kind of at least establishing the online program for people and then being a point person to help with, you know, if somebody has a question about a particular plant or a particular phenophase, being the one that's there to kind of guide the observations through. So does that resonate with anybody? Is that something that a role that you are already sort of serving in where you are helping other people with the observations and the program? Our bloom times fit with the growing degree day OSU program. Mm -hmm. The pollinators we just basically started and I, I know Denise had maybe two years of data and she would have a table that would show what plants the pollinators favored, for example. Yep. Uh, I, I hope we can expand on that. I hope there are others who are interested in getting that data. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what the hope is. And I think um, the folks that sort of self-identify to be local phenology leaders, are the ones that maybe really want to see that happen. So they're, they're willing to kind of work with us or work with Denise or somebody to kind of say, okay, let me help you. Let me help you at least get the data that you need, or let me help you um, look at the data or print out a report or make an annual report for this particular garden. And then um, again, there, that, that kind of breeds other people being interested in the program. If somebody locally really takes, takes the lead on that and is kind of a point person, then you can really get a lot more people engaged. So here's the information about all that stuff. So if, if people were just coming to Nature's Notebook and they didn't know what to do, um, you might wanna read through some of this, but that information about the class that I have is here. I also have a summer short course that will be enrolling in June and it starts in July for three weeks. And it's kind of less about um, coming up with a sustainable long-term plan and more about just learning, you know, where things are online. And, you know, if you, need, if you are working with other volunteers, where are the resources available to you to share that with other people? So um, I will make sure that you all are on my email list. And again, you can unsubscribe at any time, but I'll be sending out information about that in the next few weeks. So if that's something that's interesting to you and you do want to take a little bit more of a, a hands-on role with recruiting people and doing that kind of work, then um, I would recommend at least the summer short course because then together you'll work with other people who are kind of in the same place and everybody collectively has better ideas than I do. So <laughs> I think, um, that's a good way to go. 
Have you gotten any programs that focus on climate change? I know, I know what are, are your last webcast, you said you got you have to have a minimum of 30 years of data. We've been at it for 10, so it, our data would have to be combined with some older data. And Is there anybody focused on climate change? Yeah, I mean, I think the end goal is to be focusing on climate change, but um, yeah, we don't quite have enough data in Nature's Notebook to do that. Some of our other tools that we do have, though, the Track a Lilac program, I think probably you all have lilacs at your in your gardens. Um, that is something that is wrapped up in what we also call spring casting, and um, it tracks the onset of spring and the, the models that our um, staff have made with using this very long-term data set that we've had for 60 years. That's the one that was featured on the um, Nature, PBS Nature Show, um, is something that we do have enough data that we can start to, somebody can start to look at it and see you know, what, what exactly is this telling us. The one limitation that we have here at the NPN is that we don't have a staff of researchers that have these questions. Um, we're basically just curating the data and making it available to other people that have these questions. So um, you can read about some of the research that has been done on um, using either our data or other phenology data sets that have been around for a while. Um, one place to get that information is on this highlighted publications page in more ways to connect and then um, we also have these linked to my colleague Aaron writes up sort of summaries of journal articles that have come out either using our data or using other data sets like I said and then she just kind of gives a, a summary of it here and then the full citation to the journal article is there if that's something that you're interested in so I think as we go along, people are definitely um, looking more towards, okay, we're starting to have enough data where we can tell a story about how things are changing. And so as that becomes available, we will certainly be sharing that information with other people. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Okay, so the next thing here on the list is the Start a Phenology Program link. This is where those of you that do not have a group already set up in that list of Ohio gardens will go to tell us to set up the group. So um, I will, why don't I put this in the chat box too, but I, again, I'm gonna write up all these notes for you so you'll have a, a sheet to refer to later. Um, oh my goodness, my computer is protesting this morning, desperately. Okay. Um, so basically what you'll need to do is um, scroll down on this page and in the middle here it says ready to set up a group and then um, what you need to do is just click on this link where it says review our requirements and request a new group. So that will give you some very basic information about setting up the group in Nature's Notebook. And you'll have to click through some of these things um, that kind of tell you the purpose of having a Nature's Notebook group. I think you all know that because we've, we've had discussions about that and you all know the value of having a long-term phenology program like the one from Ohio. Um, but not everybody knows that. So we have this as kind of like a, a checklist for people as they're coming to it. And um, thinking about things like, we really want to encourage people that are setting groups up to make sure that they have at least a small group of people to observe for at least two years. So um, that's the first thing, you check that off and then you go to the next thing. And then um, we really wanna have at least two people per site. Um, and one, one person should be an admin like I described so that um, if there are at least two people, if one of the person leaves <laughs> and somebody else can still access that site. We've had a lot of groups that didn't think about that ahead of time or it's not really included in um, what the site or the garden is doing um, and that's where we run into problems. So if we have a volunteer that comes along and is really dedicated and wants to observe with Nature's Notebook but the people at the Botanical Garden don't know that the volunteer is doing that or aren't really interested in having a nature's notebook program um, those are the sites that when that volunteer kind of gets done with it they move on and then no one can access the site or no one can access it. so 
Um, I have a, a form that people can fill out that's like a sustainability plan that can be left with somebody at the garden or with another volunteer. So we just want to make sure that it doesn't just vaporize after somebody's great work goes into it and then um, they, they leave. We want to make sure we have a way to have that continued if somebody comes up to step up later. The data is always going to be there, so that's not a big deal. But um, we regularly have people from a botanical garden that come to this as though that had not happened yet before. So it would be like somebody, not one of you all, but somebody else comes and says, hey, I want to start a nature's notebook program at this Ohio phenology garden and I'm gonna start from scratch. <laughs> and we're like, well, we already have this whole thing that people put a lot of work into. So let's see if we can figure out how we can get you access to that site and, and you can sort of resurrect it and move it forward. So anyway, um, I think there's about five things here which, you know, publicly accessible location. I think that's not an issue. All of you all are doing that because they're already established. Um, knowing that we are using the standardized protocol and what that means. So that's a little bit about what I was describing with the photo guides and everybody kind of reading the protocol and answering the same question. Again, not something you're not familiar with. <clears throat> and then um, really thinking about the goals for the program I think is important. Because we do ask every year at the end of the year, we want people to tell us what they're doing with their groups um, because it's interesting to know what results people are seeing, not just the data, but also the other um, anecdotal evidence that they have that they're participating with groups of people. And um, so we do an evaluation of all the active groups that are in Nature's Notebook every year, hoping that they will tell us that information so that we can describe that to other people. And um, one of the other things that's on our list is to create more of an online um, communication platform so that people can talk to each other instead of everybody just emailing me about how do you do this one thing or do you know somebody that's observing in Ohio, um, having a better way for people to share information and having a better way for people to talk about what their goals are and what their impacts have been, I think, is critical to um, people feeling like this is, this is actually a big thing. So once you go through all that and you agree to the terms, um, you'll get to this place where you can submit a group request. And that is what we need to create the information online. So um, if your garden wasn't one of the ones on the list, we'll just need you to fill out this form. It's not super long. It's just kind of giving us a sense of where you are and what you're doing. Um, and then at the end, there's a place that you can say this should be part of the Ohio Phenology Gardens so that Sarah, my colleague who makes the groups up, will um, know to nest that within that hierarchy and then you'll be ready to go. It really just takes her a couple days once she gets the request form to go in and create the group in the database and then she'll email you and let you know that it's ready and um, at that point it will be one of the ones that shows up on the list. So if you've already created your Nature's Notebook account and you needed to go back and join the group, then what you'll do is click on this My Account Details link and that will take you back to the place where you can edit your account and join another group. So um, it brings you back to that same place that I showed you earlier where if you scroll down, you get the list of partners. And so once Sarah tells you that that group is ready, then you can come in here and check it off on the list and save it and then it'll be ready for you. She'll make you an admin when she does that so that you can be the person to go in and add the plants and the animals that are at your site, give them the right nicknames and get that all set up for everybody that's going to be using that observation deck. Does that make sense? I think so. Okay. Probably when you sit down to do it, you'll have a question, which is totally fine. <laughs> you can just email me and I am happy to help you get all of that going. So, and then once that's ready, then the only thing that will be left to do is um, if you do have a second person that you would like to be an admin, Sarah can add that person as an admin when you do that group request or um, we can, you can always go back and add people as an admin. So admins can add people and they can remove people from the group. Let me just show you that really quick too. So once, once you've set everything up, if you are, let me find the site that I'm an admin on. 
if you click on this manage users page, you can go in and see all of the people that have joined your group. For this particular one, I have a lot because it's the um, Campus Arboretum and we've got several college courses that use Nature's Notebook in their class. Um, but all I need to do if I wanted to make somebody an admin is highlight their email address and then click group admin and they will be able to have the same um, privileges that you do about adding the plants and moving them in different order and that kind of thing. So that is um, something that, that you can do if you ha identify somebody else that's willing and able to help you get everything set up online. And then the last thing I'll mention is once you have all of that set up, then um, if you are going to use the mobile app, we tell everybody to make sure that you have everything set up on the computer first so that when they log in on the phone, they already have access to the sites that they need and that everything shows up because it'll just load your account and it'll load all of your sites and then you'll be ready to make observations on the, on the phone. So um, just get everything set up on the computer first and then you can go and download the app and it'll all be ready for you. And if you're not going to use the app, the place where you will enter your observational data is here on this enter observations link. So if you click on that, um, you'll get a page that looks just like the data sheets that we've got. And that's where you'll go in and enter the data from your data sheets and put it in here. Because that, of course, is the most important thing is to make sure that it is going into the database so that everybody that is interested in the data can have access to it as it is available. My computer is very slow today. Question? Yep. Um, I think about 40% of our plants are already on your site. So when we add the other 60%, mm -hmm. um, they won't become active until next year. Did I understand that correctly? Yeah, I need to check with my data manager to see if she is able to add them sooner than that. I cannot promise that she can, um, but I think because you all are a group that's been around for a while, and I know she's going to also be working with Denise on migrating the data that you already have somehow into our database. I think, <clears throat> excuse me, all of that will be part of that conversation. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, it does take a little bit of time for her to add the plants, but if some of them are already in the same protocol, it's not as difficult. So we'll just have to see um, what that is. Thanks. Yeah, good question. And then you can see that this looks just like the, the data sheet where you it also you can also read the uh, protocol here if you need to. Um, and then click on yes or no. Whatever your answer is when you're ready. And again, you can always say I don't know if you're not sure. And then this has the drop down for the intensity if you're going to capture the intensity for the, the ones that have that particular protocol. Um, so there you have it. Good question. Okay. Pat has a question. I hope you don't mind me saying this out loud, but I think it's valuable. She um, chatted to me about getting added to an admin on one of the accounts. We can do that too. So um, we'll, I'll just email Sarah and let her know to make you an admin because she can go behind the scenes and do it that way. Um, that's the limiting thing is if we're not, we can do it behind the scenes in the database, but if you're externally trying to do that and you weren't originally the admin on the site, then you can't have that access until we do it. So if that's the case for anybody, if um, you have one of those sites that we already have on there and you're not already listed as an admin, let me know that and then um, Sarah can go in and make you an admin for that group. So do I need to contact Sarah or, you, or you'll I'll ask? do it for you. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, just after we get off the call. Um, so yeah, send me an email if, if that's the case for one of the rest of you. Um, and then we'll make sure that you get added to the, the one that you need. Um, and then the other thing would be if you're not, if you don't already have a group, then we need to get those going um, pretty quickly so that y'all can get the, the data in there. So that being said, my homework assignment for today is to summarize what I just shared with you and send you some resources. And then um, I had written down a list, I don't have it right in front of me right now, of the folks that were needing new groups set up in there. So 
Um, what I would like for you to do is once I send you that information, if you need a group that's not already created in nature's notebook for the gardens, then um, go through that process that I just described on the four groups menu and start a phenology project. If you can go through that to start that rolling and then as soon as Sarah gets it, she'll set up the group for you and then you'll be able to go in and add your plants. Okay. Um, the last thing that I will point out is the place where we have all of the resources. <clears throat> so you can see on the sidebar here on this sort of phenology program, we've got a, a list of all things that you might need. So resources for making observations. We've got the learn how to observe page, the species list, the plant and animal phenophase definitions, the QAQC stuff that people ask us about. We've got basic botany and intensity quizzes. Um, those are gonna be turned into that observer certification course, but they're here right now. The frequently asked questions page is a good one um, once you're first getting started because we've got stuff on here about creating your site and adding your species, but also um, about making observations and some of the phenophase questions are on here. So if there's something when you're reading the protocol and you're not quite sure about, this should be your first stop in um, seeing if we've got an answer for you already. Because every time somebody asks us a question about the protocol, we write it down and then we add it to our resource. So I think we've cataloged most of the things that people ask. Um, so that is a good place to start. And relatedly, you can always access this frequently asked questions page by clicking on this help button at the top. If you click on that, you will also find those little animations that I was describing about, you know, how to join a group for collecting observations. So this would be something that once your group is established, if there's other people that are going to monitor, they can join the group using the steps that I showed you earlier about ticking the box on the partner profile. Um, and how do I add things? Here's the species request form that we talked about. Um, people that enter the wrong plant species, we would show you how to fix that. Um, if the observations you entered on your mobile app aren't showing up, here's, here's some information about how to do that. And so all that stuff is linked here on this help page. And we also have um, these, what we call nature's notebook nuggets. So they are a little bit more detail about particular protocols that people have asked us questions about. So this is something else that you can read through um, if you have questions about it. So that's a place. Look. And then um, we have a glossary of terms. I want to go back one more page here and I'll show you. We also have the, the botany primers that I sent out to those of you who were on the call the other day and the phenophase primer. So that has a lot of information about the protocol there itself. And um, most recently we did a webinar a few weeks ago um, entitled Phenophase Questions Answered. So that's something that you might want to tune into. Again, those, we picked out the ones that most people have questions about. Um, so we put that all together so people can, can take a quick, quick look at that, a quick spin about that or read the slides with the information. I have two questions. Lauren. Sure. Yeah. Um, if we have uh, if we have additional plants that you have on your database but haven't typically been part of the uh, Ohio database, should we just go ahead and add those too? Yeah, absolutely. That's, okay. Yeah. And this, the second one, I didn't receive the book. Have you already sent those? And should they arrive by now? I think we sent them. Uh, I want to say maybe like Wednesday of last week. So okay. probably this week they'll they'll come. I okay, that makes sense. Right. How fast? Just thought I'd ask. <laughs> yeah. So they let me know if you don't have it by the end of next week. Let me know. Okay. But I think it should come this week. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So what other questions can I answer right now? Anybody have any other burning questions? Under frequently asked questions, maybe they've already answered this, but one of the difficulties we've had with the sunflower project is they want um, pollinators per minute per flower. 
Mm -hmm. And defining flower became uh, a challenge in, on some of the plants. Okay, yeah, for sure. Um, we do have some information about that, and it is in the botany primer, but um, basically it describes what is a flower. Um, and we consider a flower, depending on the species, it could be a catkin, which is an inflorescence. So there's like a cluster of flowers. We, we count that as one flower. And then, you know, your typical flower, especially with a sunflower, because all those little things are individual flowers. So um, depending on how their protocol is set up, they may have some information if they just mean, you know, the thing that looks like a flower, but is technically not a flower, because <laughs> it's many flowers, if that's what they mean by um, the number per minute, um, or if it's something else. But that yeah. is a good question that that does come up because in our um, in each of the species that we have where we've got the definition of a flower um, and also definitely the fruits there is species specific information related to that um, where it'll say for this particular species this is what we mean is the fruit or this is what the fruit looks like when it's root ripe so. I'll take a look, thank you. Yeah, sure. What else? Any other questions? Okay. Well, I think I covered my cursory list of these five or six things that I wanted to share with you, but I will type these up for you and send them to you. And then, um, I do want to make a, a tip sheet, which I think this will turn into that. But then if there's something that you think of as you're going along that you have a question about, then definitely email me and I will include it in the tip sheet. And I'll answer your question first, but I will include it in the tip sheet um, so that other people that come along will have what they need when they're getting started. Sound good? Thank you. Yeah. Anybody have anything else before I release you into your Monday afternoon? No, I, I can't think of anything. Thank you, Lorianne. Sure. Yeah. I will, um, I'll put that email together and then if you do need help with setting up the group, we can get those going this week and then you guys will be on your way. Okay. Sound good? Thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you're you. welcome. Thank you. You'll know where to find me if you have a question, so don't be shy. All right. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.